بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل لغدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي زدني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين اللهم إني أسألك علما نافعا وعملا متقبلا ورزقا طيبا اللهم اهدي قلبي وسدد لساني وسل سخيمة قلبي آمين يا رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran آية number 196 وأتم الحج والعمرة لله to complete the pilgrimage and so the major pilgrimage and the minor pilgrimage for Allah so today's um, uh, the ayah for today is the ayah that we'll be covering uh, or the ayat following from here are about the manasik of hajj which are the steps or the pillars uh, the steps in hajj and to be able to understand the ayah we need to understand uh, the steps of umrah and hajj and this is important because uh, without that we will not be able to understand the upcoming ayat uh, to its complete sense so before we do that before we go on to the detailed um, uh, explanation of the ayah we will go over the steps of hajj do you want to take a look what you have Okay, so inshallah, the, the steps of Hajj wa Umrah. So here, just to understand, Allah subhanahu wa um, so Allah subhanahu wa hajja wa umrah lillah. So what is the difference between Hajj and Umrah? So firstly, Umrah can be performed at any time of the year. Uh, um, umrah can be performed any time of the year except in the days of Hajj. What are the days of Hajj? The days of Hajj are 8th of Dhul Hijjah, 8th to 13th of Dhul Hijjah. So Umrah cannot be performed in these five days. These are five days specifically reserved for Hajj. Other than this, Umrah can be performed at any time of the year. And Hajj cannot be performed at any time of the year except these five days in, in, and in the month of Dhul Hijjah. So for example, if a person intends to perform Umrah on the 7th of Dhul Hijjah, they can do that. If they want to perform any other days of, uh, of Dhul Hijjah, they can except from the 8th of Dhul Hijjah up till 13th of Dhul Hijjah. So linguistically, the word Umrah means to visit a populated area okay and the we know the haram Allah subhanahu wa had made the, the the haram and the area surrounding it at the place where people mathaba lillah the place where people return to Allah and it is as we see even now subhanallah it's the it's the 
most populated area in 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 the world basically when it comes to the uh the act of worship which is being happening there okay so umrah again can be performed at any time of the year except the so these things are important if anyone would like to take notes uh they can do so uh because there are and these steps are a bit technical so you just have to follow along to be able to understand now what is what what things are so hajj has many steps in it but umrah for umrah to be uh valid it has um it has four steps for umrah to be valid for umrah to happen it's fairly simple and it only has four steps into it one is ihram okay what is ihram firstly ihram means to to enter in a state ihram is not clothing ihram is not a, a particular clothing yes clothing is a part of it but ihram is actually a state in which certain things become haram certain things that are usually not prohibited they are no, they are normal to do but they become prohibited and this is the state of ihram it's a state now in this state it also includes the clothing for men when they wear the the their which is called wearing their their ihram basically it's that two sheet of cloth that the that the men wear get covering their top and from the navel down up to their uh, below their knees so this is and uh, this is a part of ihram okay how do you enter the state of ihram okay so before before uh before the miqat what is miqat is your starting point for umrah where you start you have to start from a point again they are specific when you go to mecca or even before entering mecca there's uh, specific points that you can enter in the state of ihram now what are, how do you enter the state of ihram number one is niyyah intention okay so uh you you can say labbaik allahumma al umra you can say this uh, and make your intention that way now coming to the clothing the men have to wear the two sheets of cloth and they have to be of course unstitched okay and they cannot wear anything other than that so covering the top and from their uh, navel down up to the knees and women can wear anything okay anything of course loose modest it has to be there's no particular color but it has to be something that is, i mean in terms of modesty also means something that is not super uh, gl uh, glittery or tired or attractive in a sense just something modest simple and easy easy that keeps a person not uh, warm uh, just so, some something that helps you focus on ibadah and it's not hard to you know, so you just fix, fixing your clothes and stuff like that something that is easy to wear okay of course the for women now what's the covering the covering is of course the head needs to be covered okay the hijab needs to be proper uh they're from from head to toe they are covered and they can wear they can wear uh socks and shoes as well the women the men cannot wear socks the men cannot wear socks and men cannot wear uh and their shoes they cannot wear shoes they cannot wear sneakers uh they have to wear uh uh, sand, uh, uh they have to wear slippers or uh, slides or slant, uh, sandals that are that don't cover majority of their feet mostly like flip flops and things like that so that are or uh, minimal slides things like that and it's not even recommended for men to wear stitched shoes you know sometimes they have that stitching the the um uh, with the with uh, a thread so men even uh, instead it's better to wear slides and things like that okay so but women can wear socks women can wear shoes and uh women uh the only thing women have to uncover keep their face uncovered and keep their hands uncovered so if a woman covers her face okay she cannot cover her face during um uh, she could not put another uh, another another extra piece of cloth to cover their face okay she can take the, her hijab and put that over her face sometimes it's too crowded if if she's someone who covers her face but majority of the scholars agree that the face should be uncovered hands should be uncovered 
Okay, and in terms of shoes, and so it's pretty uh, flexible when it comes to women. But again, for men, they have to wear that two piece of cloth. A cloth. And when you're entering the state of ihram, it's recommended to uh, to take a bath, to take a ghusl, and then uh, to apply any kind of scent before as you're, before you're entering the state of ihram. So you're getting ready at the at the and usually that happens. Uh, men wear their ihram at a place called Miqat. Miqat is just a location where you start your Umrah or Hajj. Okay, so you starting, it's, you will have when you go to, uh, when a person go inshallah, they go to uh, Mecca, they will have starting points, like they will call Miqat. Okay, and there are different ones, there is Masjid Aisha, there are different places that people, people enter their uh, Miqat, uh, they enter in the state of Ihram, and Miqat is the starting point. So there they have like uh, stations where uh, men can make, uh, perform ghusl. And they have for ladies too, but they can do it from home as well. That's fine. Or their hotel or whatever. Um, but they have very, and, and then they put the ihram on. And while a person is putting the ihram, ihram on, like their clothing, the clothing part of the ihram, they can perf uh, they can apply perfume at that time uh, and any sanitizer, anything that has scent. Because once you enter the state of ihram, you cannot perfume yourself. You cannot apply any kind of scent, no body lotions, no, um, uh, no, uh, uh, even uh, makeup and things like that that have fragrance in them. So that should be avoided. Lip, lip balm, things like that should be unscented. Okay, until you come out of that state. Okay, so this is and avoid forbidden acts. Forbidden acts are things like cutting hair, cutting. You can't cut your hair. You can't cut your nails. You can't fight. You can't argue. Ihram again is a state. Ihram is a state. It's not just clothing. It's a state that you enter. Clothing is a part of it. And uh, so no arguing, no uh, no arguing, no fighting, no pushing, none of these things. And uh, no clipping of nails, no clipping of hair, no plucking things, no hurting things, no hunting. Um, uh, you, because your ihram, these things become haram. And in any reason haram, you cannot do all this. You cannot uh, kill any, 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 any life, whether it's plants, animal, or hurt people. Okay. And uh, also uh, in the intimacy between husband and wife, it's, it, that also becomes haram in that state. Of course, a person a person can still take a bath. A person can still wash their face in the state of haram. But don't use scented uh, things. Okay, some people think that you can't, you have to stay unclean. No, of course, you can make wudu. You, have to, you can still hustle. Uh, but you cannot use scented products when you're in the state of haram. Okay. So uh, once you're in the state of haram, then uh, you start saying the talbiyah, which is which uh, most of you would have heard. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Here I am at your service, O Allah. Labbaik la sharika lak labbaik. O God, I'm here. I'm here at your at your service, and you have uh, you have no partners. La sharika lak labbaik. Inna alhamda to you alone is all praise. Wa niyamata and all excellence. Mulk, and to you belongs all the dominion, meaning you're the most oh, powerful. La sharika, uh, la sharika la. And there's no partner to you. So this is talbiyah, which you stay, stay until from Miqat, you go up to uh, uh, the Kaaba, the Haram area. Okay, this is all the way you're saying. You're saying, labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Okay, and you start saying that. Okay, now... The days of Hajj, the days of Hajj, as mentioned earlier too, are from, uh, from the 8th of Zulhijjah to 13th of Zulhijjah. So 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. All of these, uh, the six days, actually not five, sorry. These six days are the days of uh, Hajj. Okay, why, would we, why did we talk about Umrah? Because in the next slide, we actually have three kinds of Hajj. There are three kinds of Hajj. So this, uh, so sorry, going back to Umrah only, going back to Umrah only, if a person is just going during the year just to perform Umrah, there is no Hajj, okay? So what do they do? Uh, can you go back to the uh, steps, the mandatory steps? So number one is sta the state of Ihram. Number two is uh, when a person enters the Kaaba is the Tawaf. You make Tawaf seven times. Okay, and you start from the black stone, and you and you from starting point is the black stone, and that's the ending point too. One and you make uh, seven rounds of 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 the 
uh, of uh, the tawaf, okay? Then after the tawaf, you have the sa'i. These are the mandatory ones. In between, you'd also drink zamzam after tawaf. These are sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You also uh, perform two rakah of um, uh, a prayer in front of uh, maqam ibrahim maqam ibrahim is the spot where Ibrahim a.s. stood uh, to build the Kaaba. Okay, and you will see it, it's preserved. There is a the, there is a whole place they have built their footsteps of Ibrahim a.s. that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved. And where in front of it you make two raka uh, of a two raka nafil, and these are sunnahs. Okay, mandatory steps are for entering the state of Iran, tawaf. After that, sa'i. What is sa'i? Basically, going between Safa and Marwa, running between Safa and Marwa, and this is following through the the actions of the Sunnah of Hajar alayhi salam, right? When she was looking for water for her son Ismail alayhi salam, so this is uh this is you following her footsteps, and this is mandatory, okay? And Safa wal Marwa, and this is also done seven times. After the Safa and Marwa, the 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 action of running between Safa and Marwa, it's called Sa'i. Okay, after that, the fourth step is uh, halaq or uh, qasr, which is cutting. So basically, men shave their hair and women cut about an inch of their hair. And literally, the umrah is done. So umrah can be done in a day. Umrah can be actually just done in a few hours too. It's not long. There are four mandatory steps. If a person wants to just do umrah, this is what they have to do. And umrah can be performed in just a uh, just uh, a few hours. In two hours, one person can be done with Umrah. Get a person who, who knows how to do it. They know the steps. It's pretty simple. And, and people do perform sometimes even multiple Umrahs, and that's that's allowed. Okay. Now, going into Hajj. Since uh, I, I, I asked about Umrah and Hajj, there are three types of Hajj. Okay. Number one is Quran, uh, Tamattu, and Ifrad. So these are three types of Hajj. What does it mean by three types of Hajj? Okay, so Hajj of Qiran, okay, where in this one, what happens is a person performs Umrah and Hajj together. So you can get like two, you're getting the reward of two. Where you're performing Umrah and Hajj together. How does Hajj Qiran work? Okay, so first you make the intention of Umrah and Hajj. Okay, you say لَبَّيْقَ اللَّهُمَّ umra wal hajj. So you say the your your intention. Okay, into the next slide. لَبَّيْقَ اللَّهُمَّ umra wal hajj. And here a person is performing uh, hajj and umrah together. This is called hajj qiran. Okay. Yes, it's a little. This is a little technical. This is going to be, but it's of course it's a pillar of Islam. We should know. And so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives us the opportunity to perform hajj. It's a mandatory, Hajj is mandatory for anyone who has the ability to do so, who has the financial means to do so. And it, it's a pillar of Islam. You have to, if you're able, a person is able to do so and they are financially stable and their health is good, they should do it. Okay? And they do not have debt. Okay, And then again, uh, if anyone has further questions in terms of if I'm eligible for Hajj, they should speak to the scholar in the community, go to the masjid, speak to a teacher or scholar to get that especially when it comes to things like that. Okay, Hajj Quran. So intention you may so you you are performing Hajj and Umrah together. What does together mean? It means that you put you enter the state of Ihram, you perform the Umrah, you stay in the Ihram. You don't exit Ihram. You're in that state. You perform Hajj, you sacrifice the animal, then you remove the Ihram. So basically, you put the ihram once, you don't take it off. You do your umrah, okay? Then you do, basically, you do your umrah uh, from maybe on the 7th of Zulhijjah. That's what, if people want to do hajj, uh, ha, uh, the hajj of Quran, they basically do on the 7th of Zulhijjah because from the day 8 is when all the steps of hajj start. This is the days of hajj. So basically, they do the umrah. And then, or they can do on the sixth, but they have to stay in that state of ihram. They can't remove their ihram, okay? And they have to continue in that state until until they come out of the hajj state. 
they come out of ihram. It's one ihram basically. Okay. Now the next one, the next one is Hajj Tamattu. Okay. In Hajj Tamattu, what's the difference between Quran and Hajj Tamattu? Even in Hajj Tamattu, you can do you can do Umrah and Hajj together. But the difference between this and Hajj al Quran is that when you put the ihram on, you perform the you make the intention for Umrah, you perform the Umrah, you remove the ihram. What does removing the ihram mean? What is the last step in Umrah? Cutting your hair. Cutting your hair, removing your white, your the men remove their white and they can wear regular clothes. Okay? And women also have to cut off a bit of their hair. Okay? In this point, men can shave some of their hair or all of their hair. It's up to them. The sunnah is to do, but because they're going to do hajj and fin and they're going to put the ihram again so they can shave off later after the Eid is done and everything. Okay? So they have to remove, they can remove, uh, so in tamatyo, and people prefer this one because it's just easier. They, and this can be, you can perform, for example, let's say someone got to, uh, someone got to travel, uh, let's say from Canada, they went to, uh, um, they went to Mecca in, uh, in, uh, on the first of Dhul Hijjah. So any day from then, they can perform, they can perform up till 7th, they can perform Umrah. They can come out of the city when I can do on the first day. That I get there, finish my Umrah, relax for a bit, maybe give the body a little bit of time to adjust. And then on the 8th, start my start again, get into the steps of Hajj. So you can come out of the state of Ihram, basically changing your clothes. Now you can perfume yourself. Uh, you, you can cut your hair. You have cut your hair. And, you know, those things that were haram are no longer haram. Okay, but for Hajj al Quran, the person has to stay in the state of ihram after, after doing the umrah. Okay, this is the difference between the two. Okay, so they remove the ihram, then on the eighth, they put the ihram back on, they make the intention for Hajj, they do all the steps of Hajj, and then they finally remove the ihram. The last one is called Hajj al Ifrad. Okay, Hajj al Ifrad, the third type of Hajj, which is basically you just make Hajj, no umrah. Okay, so no Umrah, just Hajj. You make the intention for Hajj, you put on your Ihram, do all the steps of Hajj, and you come out of your Ihram. Okay, I hope that is uh, clear. There is no confusion. But uh, if these are things that we should have knowledge of, about, okay, especially because may, maybe inshallah, reason, Allah Sambar gives all of us a chance to go for Hajj in our lifetime. And these are things that are important to know uh, and understand. Okay. So for Hajj Tamattu and Ifrad, what is the intention? What do you say? Allahumma labbayka hajjan. Because you have to, you come out of, uh, you come in both Tamattu and Ifrad, you put on new Ihram. Ifrad is just doing Hajj only. So you make this intention and Tamattu, after performing the Umrah, okay, you remove your Ihram, you come out of that state, and then you re-enter that state again. Okay, that's why you say Allahumma labbayka hajjan. If anyone wants, I can share the slides in the group. So if at any time, and of course, there's a lot of content available online and booklets and things for all these steps. Okay, not the steps of hajj. What are the steps of hajj? So till now, we were talking about, we spoke about the steps of umrah. And we spoke about the different, the three different types of hajj. Okay, hajj quran, hajj tamattu, and hajj Ifrat. Okay. Now the first step that is there is a person has to go from uh, they have to go from uh the uh so they go from the the their miqat, basically they enter the haram and they go to Mina. Okay, this is a station, it's close by. Okay, they go to the place called Mina and they camp there, and this is on the eighth day. The 8th of Dhul Hijjah. It's the day 1 of Hajj. On the day 1 of Hajj, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Aisha are prayed at Mina. So from Zohar time till Aisha, it is prayed and person can shorten their Salah. They can shorten their Salah. They can't combine it, but they can shorten it. Okay, because they're in a state of traveling. Okay, so Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Aisha are prayed at Mina on the 8th of Zul Hijjah. 
Then the next, so uh, what is the sunnah of the Prophet The sunnah of the Prophet was that he would spend a whole day at Mina, pray the Fajr prayer and wait until sunrise. So basically what he would do, he would pray, he would pray Zohar, uh, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, okay, and then wait until Fajr of the next day, okay? And the next day, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. Okay, so this is what happens. It's not, if you follow the step sequential, it's not actually very complicated. It's not that complicated. It's simple. On the eighth day, where are you going? You're going to Mina. It's an encampment. There are going to be camps there. We're going to stay from Zohar, uh, Asur, Maghrib, Isha, and the Fajr of next day. Okay, and you're going to pray there. And that's to stay in the state of Ibadah. That's on the eighth, the first day one. Is the eighth of Zul Hijjah. Next comes the ninth of Zul Hijjah, which we all know is the day of Arafah. What do we all do on the day of Arafah? We fast, right? The day of Arafah is the one who fast on the from the Hadith of Absalom, the one who fast on the day of Arafah, their previous year sins and their upcoming year sins are forgiven. Okay? And this is the day of, of course, the whole journey of Hajj is, is a time to make dua. And the one who performs Hajj and their Hajj is accepted, they come out of the Hajj as a newborn, basically sinless, without any sins. Okay, so, but the most important day in Hajj is the day of Arafah. Those who are performing Hajj and they are physically at Arafah, they do not fast. We fast. The people who are not performing Hajj, they fast on the day of Arafah. But the people who are performing Hajj, they don't fast on the day of Arafah. Okay? So what is Arafah? Okay, Arafah is a plain. Again, it's a small hill. Okay, and that whole area is called Arafah. The whole area, there is going to be a small hill. You would see. And um, from the Hadith of the Prophet Sallam, he Prophet said, Al-Hajju Arafah. Hajj is Arafah. It's like basically all of the essence of Hajj is on the day of Arafah. Whoever reaches the night of Arafah before rising of the sun at dawn, the next day he has completed his pilgrimage. So what it was a thing that you do? So you stay in Arafah. So after Mina, you leave the next day. And before Zohar, you get to Arafah, which is the day, uh, day Zul Hijjah 9, day 2. 9th of Zul Hijjah, day 2. Okay. Uh, what are the things that a person does? Make a lot of dua. Ask Allah's forgiveness. As for Allah, this is the day, you know, you see a lot of people making dua. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Um Salama reported that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had his, both his hands up in the air, okay, and from Zohar until Maghrib. And he was making dua continuously. This is a time to make a lot of dua, okay, out on the day of Arafah. So, and, um, and, the, and it's a sunnah of the Prophet that he would pray Zohar and Asr together, okay, at Zohar time on the day of Arafah, at Arafah. And there are a few pictures you'd see of people gathered on this hill, okay, making a lot of dua on, on Arafah. The masnoon, the sunnah dua to make is La ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika lahu. There is no God but Allah, the one having no partner with him. Lahul mulku wa lahul hamdu. To him belongs the dominion, and to him belongs all the praise. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Okay, so la ilaha illallah wa dahu la sharika lahu. Lahul mulku wa lahul hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. This is the dua to make on the day of Arafah. And even the people who are not at Hajj can make this dua. We can also say it. Yep. Then, after this, after, uh, so after Asr, what do you do on the second day, which is the ninth of Zul Hijjah? Okay, so I hope you're following along. Day one of Hajj is the eighth of Zul Hijjah. Day two of Hajj is the ninth of Zul Hijjah. Okay, so on the after, so after performing Zohar and Asr, from Maghrib, what do you do? You move to Muzdalifa. Okay, and you pray your, uh, pray your Maghrib and Aisha there. So again, these are all areas close by, these are stations, okay? So then you stay in Muzdalifa until Fajr time, 
can people sleep there? They spend their night there, they sleep there. And Muzdalifa usually doesn't have any camps. Literally, people are stuck together. It's again the whole journey of Hajj is a reminder of the day of judgment. The whole journey of Hajj is like a reminder of the day of judgment, just the way people will be stuck together on the day of judgment. There's not going to be any resources, there's not going to be things. Okay, of course, this dunya, we still have our water and things like that. But on the day of judgment, there is nothing except a person's deeds. Okay, and a, a, a beautiful deed is the hajj. And if a hajj is accepted, then all of the sins of a person is forgiven. Okay, so a person moves to Muzdalifa, they pray Maghrib and Isha, and spend the night in Muzdalifa until Fajr. And there, there you can see a picture of um, Muzdalifa, how um, people are crowded and they are sleeping or they, they literally have just like those cardboard mats that's what you sleep on some people bring the sleeping bag but that's literally there's no camp there's nothing like that okay yeah you can you can turn there okay you can just you keep it turned to them then comes so this is uh so this is the end of day nine uh sorry end of day two which is the day uh ninth of Zulhijjah. now day three which is the 10th of Zulhijjah. So day three is actually Eid. It's called Yawmul Nahab, the day of sacrifice. So we have done uh, we have done the 8th of Zulhijjah, the 9th of Zulhijjah, which is day two, and day three is the 10th of Zulhijjah. It's called, it's called Yawmul Nahab, the day of sacrifice. It's a day of Eid, the which we eat al-Adha, that we all celebrate. Okay, so what do you do on this day? After the Fajr prayer, after the Fajr prayer, okay, you will walk from Muzdalifa to the Jamara. Okay, Jamara, the next uh, one, uh, you will walk to Jamara. What is Jamara? Jamara means stoning. Okay, so part of, this is for the people on Hajj, on the day of Eid, what will they do? As you know, there are three pillars. There are three pillars at uh, at at the Jamara, okay. So at the Jamara, there are three. And from Muzdalifa, it's a bit of a walk, okay. They will go to Jamara. There are three pillars, okay. One is a small pillar, okay. Jamara to Sughra, that small pillar. One is Jamara to Wusta, which is the middle size. And the third one is Jamara to Kubra or Aqaba, okay, uh, or Uqaba. It's it's known as the big pillar. You will only stone the big pillar. That's it. Okay. Seven stones to the big pillar. On the day of Eid, what are the people doing? They have to stone only the big pillar. Okay. Seven times. Seven stones, basically. Okay. And whenever, whenever you're stoning, what people are stoning, what they have to say, Allah Akbar. For every time a person throws a stone, Allah Akbar. Okay. After that, after that, you could return to Mina after throwing the stones at the big pillar and perform tawaf or sa'i on any day after. So basically, the main things that needs to be done on the day, the 10th day, the 10th day, the main thing needs to be done is stoning that bigger, biggest pillar and sacrifice. That's the main thing that needs to be done, sacrificing the animal. Okay, so how people, in, in Eid al-Adha, what is the sunnah to sacrifice, right? So that's what people have to do on the 10th day, which is the day of Eid, okay? The person needs to do is stone the biggest pillar at the Jamara and, uh, and the uh, sacrifice of the animal. Now with that, this is the day of Eid, okay? With, this is the day of Eid, okay? Also, people at, at the day of Eid, they partially come out of the Ihram. Now you can perfume yourself, you can wear a nice jubba, abaya, whatever, new dress, okay? Uh, the only thing people cannot do, because they're still a little bit in that state, they've not exited the hajj completely, is not have, the, the, the uh, people cannot have marital relation. Other than that, they can, uh, they can now come out of the ihram, they can now come, uh, they can uh, perfume themselves and all of that, Okay? Also, the other thing that needs to be done, and it can be done on the 10th day or 11th, 12th, or, or the 11th or the 12th. 
Okay, because it gets too crowded on the tenth and everyone's trying to do is to also again make tawaf and sa'i. Actually, it's not again because we till now in Hajj, in the steps of Hajj, we have not made tawaf. We have not done tawaf and sa'i. The ta tawaf and sa'i that I mentioned was for Umrah. Till now, the tawaf and the sa'i are not done. So between 10 to 12, day 10 to 12, people need to make tawaf and sa'i. And of course, the, what, if, if a person has to make tawaf, they, they have to go back into, they have to wear their ihram. Okay, and the, for the men, the, their shoulder needs to be right, shoulder needs to be exposed. Okay, so this needs to be done. It doesn't have to be done on the day 10, which is the Eid day. It can be done on day 11th or 12th too. Tawaf and Sa'i. Okay, now, now what needs to be done? Okay, sacrifice. Uh, okay, Tawaf, you see, women will only cut. A fingertip length of their hair, then they perform the tawaf, the tawaf and sa'i. Okay, after sacrificing and shaving, okay, a person uh, on day 11. And so, what is the purpose of day 11, 12, 13? Because they're also part of the, you know, when a person has done their tawaf and sa'i and all of that, what is the purpose of day 11, 12, and 13, which is of there's still three more days left of Hajj? What do you do? Okay, so these three days, a person spends at Mina, okay, in their camps. Every day, so for example, day, day, then the day of Eid is done. Now, the 11th of Dhul Hijjah, they go back to Mina, okay, they go back to Mina, they collect 7 plus 7 plus 7, 21 stones, and they stone these three pillars, of the, 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 the Jamara area, okay, between Zohar and Maghrib. Basically, these, these rest of the days are spent stoning the pillars. And other than that, it's all ibadah. You make dua, you're in the state of zikr, you're, you're praying, okay, all of these things you're doing, okay? And then, so uh, you uh, throw seven stones while saying Allahu Akbar on the small pillar, middle, so small Jamara, Middle Jamara and Big Jamara. Big pillar, small, small pillar, big pillar, middle pillar, and big pillar. Ask Allah's forgiveness and make sure you're following. You're not on your cell phones. You're not, you're, you're still focused on, you're still in the state of Hajj. Hajj is not over. Okay? Then, on, so this is the same thing that happens on day 11 and 12. So basically, the actions, the rituals, the rituals on these two days, 11th and 12th, are stoning, stoning the Jamara. And on the day of Eid, which was the 10th of Zul Hijjah, you only stone the big Jamara. You don't stone the rest of the other two. We do, and the main thing is follow the Sunnah. You don't go above Rasulullah Sassan. You don't go above him. You don't be extra, you know what I'm gonna, what, what does those pillars signify? The she, the she, uh, it signifies shaitan. Some people try to do, be very extra and then start hitting on the 10th day, also start hitting the other rest of the, Pillars. No, just do one, the big one, and the 11th and the 12th, you stone all the three pillars. Okay? So, again, stoning is done between Zohar and Maghrib time. And then after that, you are you are, uh, you are are free to do any kind of ibadah. You're still in a state of ibadah. Okay? On the day, on after, so when you're done stoning on day 12, what do you do? You can complete your hajj by moving out of Mina. Okay? And if you, if you choose, if you choose to remain in Mina after Maghrib, you will need to stay for the last day of stoning as well. Okay, so basically, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was he stayed until the thirteenth of Zul Hijjah at Mina. Okay, after in the and the third last day, the last day which is the thirteenth of Zul Hijjah. Okay, you do again the stoning. Basic 11, 12, 13, you're just stoning these pillars, okay? And on the 13th, your hajj is complete and you do a farewell tawaf. You just do a farewell tawaf, which is seven times. You go around the Kaaba and hajj is officially complete, okay? Now, and then a person can uh, uh, return back to their, their, to their homes. 
So this is all the steps of Hajj. Okay, these are all the steps of Hajj. Basically, in Hajj, you come out of the Ihram partially on the day of Eid. And then completely after you have done your farewell Hajj. Okay, and partially meaning you can... Assalamu have... alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Sorry. Okay. So um, things that are prohibited. Using perfume again at the during in the in the time of Ihram. These are all things that are pro prohibited at the time of uh, in the in the state of Ihram, which we already mentioned earlier. Okay. So if we if we share uh, this, just a summary of all the steps that were shared for um, during Hajj. Let me share it again. Okay, so basic, this is a summarized version of all the steps of of Hajj. Okay, so day day one, and then day two. Day day one is if you will perform tawaf if you're doing the umrah. Okay. You only perform tawaf if you're doing the umrah. Otherwise, if a person is has already done the umrah and they've come out of the state of ihram, then their hajj starts at mina. Okay, and they only perform the tawaf and sa'i after the on the tenth day or after that. Okay, again, I understand this is this is something technical. And the best way to understand the steps of Hajj and Umrah is to do it. The one who has done it can easily understand and explain better. Okay. Uh, so when you do it, otherwise this is just theory, right? This is just theory. So then you do these, these steps, these manasik, they're called manasik. These are steps, parts of Hajj. Okay. When a person does this and Hajj is called a journey of lifetime. The journey of an each each person it is a pillar that should be fulfilled if a when a person is able to do so, okay and and to check the eligibility of a person they should just contact their um the main thing is to not uh, uh be owing something because the debt needs to be paid before also hedge can be performed on behalf of another person someone's parents have passed okay and they have let's say wealth left inheritance. But they, that parent did not perform Hajj. So from the wealth, first thing before distributing the wealth, you know how we did about the distribution of wealth and will and all that. The first thing that needs to be done is that the, the child should perform Hajj on behalf of the parent. But the one performing the Hajj should have first performed Hajj themselves first. Then they can perform with someone else. Okay, so now after all these things, the the what is the ISA? I number one. 90, 196 about uh, so hopefully this gives you a background about Hajj okay now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go on part of this ayah complete the Hajj and Umrah for Allah and this is the this is the usul in, in anything of deen we need to complete it we need to start we need to complete Whenever we start something, not just Hajj or Umrah, anything you commit to when it comes to deen, okay? Whether it's a course, whether it's a class, whether it's an action, whether it's helping someone, you complete it. Yes, you bring it to completion. And ibadah needs to be done to completion, okay? And do not take, take on yourself too much. Do not commit to too much when you cannot fulfill it. Small and but consistent actions. So the Hajj and Umrah are for Allah and Lillah meaning what? Why does Allah say the Hajj and Umrah are for Allah? Because sometimes uh, people or it is uh, taken as a thing of show off. Oh, I went for Umrah. I went for Hajj. I've done these many Hajj. They're for Allah and they're not for they, this should not, these actions, acts of ibadah should not uh, increase or bring pride in a person. 
They're not there only and only for the sake of Allah. Okay. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that فَإِنْ أَخْسِرْتُمْ فَمَا اسْتَيْسَرَ مِنَ الْحَدِي And if, but if, um, but if someone is prevented from proceeding, then offer whatever sacrificial animals you can afford. Meaning, if you're not able to get to any step of Hajj. Hajj has many steps, right? What if a person is not able to fulfill one of the steps of Hajj? Okay, what if this came in, uh, what if their ihram got violated? Okay, what if like uh, for some need, they had to wear socks? Like, you know, people have injuries and then they have to wear socks, let's say. But you're not allowed, uh, allowed to wear anything stitched or cover your feet for men, for example. Okay, or for some reason, you could not get to uh, a certain point or maybe you got into a fight or something. It is also violates the state of ihram. So if any any of the state any or any of the steps are missed, or a person doubts that there is something, what should they do? Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, uh, then Allah Subhanahu wa says that wala wala tahliku ru'usakum hatta ya bulug al ya ya bulug and and do not shave your head until you have sacrificed the basically if offered. Uh, if if you have offered uh, a, a, a kafara for any missing step. So you have to pay up for any missing step that happens. This can also be for women. So for, what happens? What if a woman goes for hajj and her cycle begins? That does not mean she does not perform hajj. She can perform hajj. The only thing she cannot do is pray and do tawaf. But she can do all the other steps. And then she can offer the, because she's missing out the tawaf element of it. So what does she do? She she pays up. What are the so we're gonna come up? What is the fidya? What is the uh, what is the what is the payment for any mistakes during Hajj? Okay, so if a person, for example, is so one of the one of the examples here is given if a person falls sick sick many times people faint they're unable to do certain jump like for example jamara or things like that they're unable to do it or for example they're not able to shave because they have some skin skin like eczema or something like that or some skin ailment okay then what is what is the what is the payment for it for fidyatun min suyamin number one is fasting they can fast when they come home come back let's say someone's gone we get, i'm giving an example of canada because that's where we live Let's come back to canada and that person has to fast for three days for each misstep fasting three days okay that's one either that or sadaqa what is sadaqa here you you feed Six people, one meal. So that's six people, one meal. Aw nusuk, or sacrifice. This sacrifice is not a sacrifice of Eid. It's a separate sacrifice. Okay, and now they even have apps that you can just do, order, pay, pay up for the sacrifice. And pay up for the... So either of these three actions are enough. Either one. There's no one better or, uh, you know, more or less. Any one of these three options can be done if a person makes a mistake in their hajj or violates their, their one of the steps. And these are all some, these are the actions a person is aware of. We should not do it just because you're in doubt. What if like none of us know if our hajj is perfect, right? These are only the actions which you intentionally know you might have missed out. You might have, you, you intentionally know that this, this actually happened. You couldn't get to some place. You felt sick. You felt ill. You had to go back for some reason. You had to. So you've missed out a, these few steps or whatever. So for each step that a person missed, they, they this is one of the three things they can do. Either fast for each step, either fast for three days when they get back to their home, or they can feed uh, the six people one meal. Okay. This can be done even at the time of when they're in Makkah. 
they can there are a lot of people who need who can be fed or sacrifice an animal which is other than on the day of Eid. Okay, this can be done. Okay, so all of these three are the are the fidya, are the payment for any mistake that a person makes. Okay, so uh, inshallah, bismillah, we will uh, we'll stop here because it's too much info, I believe. Okay, so we learned about the steps of Umrah, the different kinds of Hajj, and the steps of Hajj, and what happens if one of if we make a, a mistake that we are well aware of, what is the payment? Because because no, we cannot re redo the Hajj. They're only done in these particular days. So we have to pay the fidya, okay? And these three things qualify as a fidya, as mentioned again in the ayah. Number one is to uh, either uh, feed six people or um, either fast for three days when you get back to your home city, you're back to Canada or back to your location. And third is to sacrifice an animal, okay? And either one of can, of them can be done, okay? So inshallah, bismillah, uh, keeping these things in mind, Make a lot of dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives um, uh, us the opportunity to make hajj or umrah for, for the, you know, at least at least umrah. So you get the taste of hajj. Umrah is, again, umrah can be performed in a few few hours, any time of the any time of the year except the days of hajj, which is 8th of Zul Hijjah to 13th of Zul Hijjah. And hajj can be performed, hajj is only performed during that time. Of course, hajj is way more costly. There is it, it has you have to be financially able to be performed to be able to perform Hajj. So we should also have the intention to make Hajj. How do you have the intention to make Hajj? You start saving up. You have to sacrifice on the luxuries of life to be able to save up. If you're able to save up for Hajj, and people do, people save up for their Hajj. And um, we should make the intention to start saving up even a little bit, you know, make a Every month we can save up a little bit of amount. And um or if you intend to perform Umrah first, then just perform Umrah just to get a taste of it. But trust me, when you perform Umrah, you definitely want to go for Hajj. Because this place, you know, Allah SWT says that this place, Allah SWT has kept when a, when a person goes once, they always want to go back. It's called Masaba, the place of return. Where people return, return, they want to go back. Any person you ask who's gone gone to the to these this these these the holy land this these places, uh the 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 haram they want to go back and back and back and this is this is this is a miracle of Allah. It's not based on because someone is more spiritual. It's just that place is such. And when it comes to Medina, of course, this that that that's the prophet city, Masjid Nabi performance that but going to Medina is not it does it's not a part of any of the steps of Umrah or Hajj. But of course, a person has gone for to Makkah, they should definitely go to Umrah and praying in the Prophet's mosque, okay? That had a reward of a thousand prayers. So a person should definitely do go there and pray and uh, visit all of the places. You know, you connect with the Prophet uh, uh, and, and you know, that was the place of the Prophet, right? And so, inshallah, bismillah, we will end our uh, class. If anyone has any questions or if you want to, would like to know more, a lot of resources again are available online. There are videos of stuff. Videos are even better. Pictures better than pictures. You can see how each and every step of Hajj. And inshallah, for the next ayat, knowing this background will help us to understand all of these things, the monastic of Hajj even better. Inshallah. Okay, may Allah want to give each one of us the opportunity to do that. And if anyone would like to share any reflection of of Hajj. And again, Hajj is a it's a reflection of um the 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 performance of Hajj. It's like uh it's an example of you know uh day of judgment, right? Where you have where and, and you know you're carrying the minimal. You have nothing on the day of judgment. Of course, nothing. And that's literally the example of a person's life. It's a journey of a person's life, even in dunya. You bear minimal. You still are able to live. You're still able to breathe. What is your focus, Allah? Ibadah, less distractions, okay, less dining out, less exploring. You're just focused on ibadah, right? Like a traveler. In Hajj, everyone is like a traveler. They're going from one step to another, just like how in, in, our, in this life, we're going from one step to another, and you can survive on bare minimum and, you know, resources. The focus is ibadah, not clothing, and this and that, and all the other distractions.
right? Anyways, if anyone would like to share any reflection. Um, like the other thing I learned about French, uh, really like made me realize the importance of following the Sunnah, even if it's something small, like doing this one before you pray, and like very small things, it's very important to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also following the steps based on what is Sunnah steps, not things that you just do on your, this is why knowledge is so important. And people come all around the world, and a hut teaches you also patience and tolerance. People from all around the world come, different kind of people different type you know of knowledge but how do we know what we're doing is that's why we need to when we're going for hajj and umrah we have to educate ourselves first you educate yourself your hajj and umrah becomes more beneficial before you even go for it take courses there are a lot of seminars especially during this time is offered because hajj season hajj, uh, season is coming up inshallah right so education and the you know, importance you only value a lot of people go for Umrah and Hajj, but they come out without any change because they don't understand what they're doing. Right. So understand when you understand now, like you would want to go and you would want to perform these actions and the action based on the Sunnah of the Prophet. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I think it's very important to realize we will end our class here. And see you all next next week and as we will continue these um next ayat. Uh or we'll finish this ayah and then continue the next ayat. Inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaqfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.